Clark. I'm sure there's a multitude of questions. And uh, we only have, what, two minutes? We don't have a lot of, we don't have a lot of time for the QA tonight, but let me start off by asking a couple of questions. Of course. Well, one, uh, what, uh, what attracted you to, this is almost kind of a departure from the zombie apocalypse films we've seen, where it's more of a rapture apocalypse. What uh, attracted you to the story, Jack, to use a uh, screenplay? Uh, I think maybe to, to the fact that there weren't any real uh, clear-cut explanations, you know? Um, the fact that these people are sort of thrown into this apocalyptic scenario, but they're all searching and grappling to try to find answers, and in doing that we kind of learn about what's driving them, you know? So it was, to me, less the idea of a, making a movie which delivered an explanation as much as seeing how these four souls kind of struggle with their own mortality in a way. That was what was interesting to me about it. And just, you know, the idea of how the, the technical and, and creative challenge of trying to make darkness into the monster, right, as opposed to having, you know, it be some physical presence, having darkness itself be the, the, the danger, you know. And that, so we, we, you know, we, we, we did a lot of uh, work in trying to create the, you know, the sort of shadow effects or, you know, just uh, how to create that sense of impending doom but not have it be literalized in a figure. Yeah. Much more than I mean, when, when I first saw this, there was a working progress and I saw it on a very small screen. Now seeing it in the space of the sound mix just makes a total difference and you really yeah. have to work on that so far. Well, sound design is a really critical element, I think, in any sort of movie that deals with creating a dark, scary tone. You know? And a lot of the sort of elements and the, the the sounds of the sounds of darkness, where you know there are baby screams and slowed down baby wails and backwards <laughs> seal barks and all sorts of fun, fun kind of uh, noises that. You know, that just felt very incongruous. That was always the idea. Just find noises that didn't feel like they fit. I'd like to ask you all uh, about what attracted you to the script. And also, it's a very different kind of, it's a very intense performance because you're dealing with a threat that isn't really physical. And I mean, for a young actor like yourself, how did Brad give you direction on dealing with something which you really couldn't see? Well, it was pretty easy. Um, I've always wrote for you like this before, and uh, it was just kind of easy just getting into the character. And Brad just went to the first one and said, so it just all worked out for the best. <laughs> <laughs> Psychologically, what it means, and, and, and trying to, you know, have your own sanity. Um, and then it was just about getting to work with, you know, a good group of actors and get to work with Brad Anderson um, and uh, the sort of the containing of, of the of the movie. Uh, you know, kind of felt like a play to me. So it was like getting to go yeah. make a movie, and make a play at the same time. It was really about trusting Brad because with a film like this, you can imagine this kind of situation. Imagine it. It, it could go as far as it's very hard to really understand what a person would do in this situation. It was really a study of madness, and um, I mean, I, it's in, unimaginable to be a woman in that situation losing her child and humanity. So it was about trusting Brad. Really, that was the bottom line for me. Um, and then I had him to kind of dial us up or dial us down, and it worked. Bravo, it was amazing. That's the first time I've seen him. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, you know, like, how do you react to a wall that's brightly lit that's supposed to have dark, creepy shadows creeping down it? You know, you guys are really good at using your imagination. I guess a lot of actors now have to do that though, with the green screens and stuff. Use your imagination. I thought that was also impressive that the, that the effect, although you used a lot of visual effects to create that darkness, darkness it's actually kind of the reverse of how most horror films now use CGI for that little physical threat. And you kind of stick to that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that we, we wanted the shadows, the darkness, if you will, to be very organic and not. Uh, occasionally you see these figures in them. And, you, know, you can interpret that as you will, whether these are the figures or shadow versions of these characters or whether they're sort of loved ones trying to pull them into the other side or whatever. But we always kept, uh, we wanted the shadows, the movement of the shadows to have an organic quality. We used a lot of, we looked at a lot of uh, odd uh, uh, images of movies of slime molds. Um, you know, that I don't know if you've ever seen fast motion, quick uh, movement of slime molds, the way they kind of move across a surface, or uh, uh, the way that water uh, or an ink block will kind of move on a piece of paper, try to create this sort of sense of organic movement in the shadow effects, so that it felt somehow real. Like, the idea was like, whatever the heck is happening, we wanted it to feel somewhat in the world of plausibility. Um, and you know, the question of what is happening and what has actually uh, taken place is, of course, you know, I always deflect that question back to the audience, because to me, the thing that's interesting is let the audience sort of, uh, let the viewer kind of come up with their own interpretation, you know, whether this is a sort of religious apocalypse, is this the rapture, is this the second coming, or is this, as John so eloquently says, is this you know, a physics experiment going wrong? Is it like a nanotech on a monk? I mean, what the hell is happening? You know, so each character is sort of looking for his own, his or her own explanation. Sort of Hayden's character plays this kind of more of the man of action. You know, like my job is just to sort of get us out of this predicament. Of course, Tandy's character is looking for some kind of, you know, uh, uh, religious or spiritual uh, explanation. So it was interesting, and I thought that was what, again, what, the script that interested me was all those, how the characters each essentially confronted their own mortality, and what that, how they would do that. Well, so we don't have much time, let me just do two questions from the audience here. During the bar scenes, um, what I noticed was that when there was particular moments of uh, despair, anger, dark emotions, or they were starting to lose hope. There was also a lack of light. Was that deliberate, or was that just affecting them on the imagination? Well, I think that the idea was that, you know, almost like the, the darkness begins to become more tumultuous, like, based on their fear of it, you know what I mean? Um, I mean, obviously there's this notion in the story, it's not, a, it's not a hard and fast rule, but there's this notion that, like, you know, light is a protective force, and darkness is a, a, a sort of life-pulling force. And, um, you know, we went with the, the idea that uh, when these characters, uh, you know, the, the idea was to sort of build the, the story in such a way that it just gets progressively more, the darkness gets progressively more scary and, and more aggressive, you know what I mean? So by the end of it, it's like attacking in a way. But, um, but yes, it's a, I guess you could say that, you know, their emotional state maybe is even kind of reflected in the, the, the Darkness. We, yeah, we, we we played with that idea. Yeah. And one last question here. Yes, the side, sir. The, uh, the only two things we've seen with mystery books are like dark matter and like Rono. Is that a clue or is that just a Well, question there. Yeah, the question was uh, in the in the beginning. John, like his almost character, projectionist, is looking through a book on the kind of mis mysteries of the world, and one of them is matter versus antimatter, and the other is. Uh, this whole notion, this whole story about the, the lost colony of Rona. Uh, dark matter, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> exists, I don't know what the difference is. Dark matter, right? The mystery of dark matter. What is it? It comprises eighty percent of the universe, or something. Oh well, yeah, there were there were all sorts of. We we threw in lots of other things into the pot, like explanations like that. The idea was to toss out explanations, and uh, because you know what would you do in a certain situation like that? You'd be reaching and, and 
striving to find some explanation for this madness, this inexplicable event. The more inexplicable it is, the more you're struggling to find an answer. And uh, yeah, Croatoan could, you know, I mean, he sees that word at the end. I mean, it, you know, maybe that is, re maybe that resonates. As, as John's character says in that one scene, it's like, you know, maybe that, maybe that's like, maybe Croatoan is like, you know, the sort of, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, your computer is crashing. Maybe the whole universe, maybe existence itself is, is crashing. I was like, so my theory is that it's that the, that 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 everything is is some kind of like computer simulation and is being shut down with some higher intelligence. That's just my theory. And on that note, let's hear it for Brad. And <laughs>